Hey folks, we are here doing Lessons Learned version two, or episode two. And this one is a 2019 Montana archery elk hunt. And the last one we did was a Nevada archery mule deer hunt. This hunt here has a lot of lessons for me to think about. Some where we didn't do the right thing and some where we did the right thing or some that we knew we were getting ourselves into. And you know what? Sometimes bad luck just comes your way. So appreciate you being here. I hope that this one is worthwhile for you. The feedback on the episode one, the Nevada archery mule deer hunt has been spectacular. So obviously the crew's on to something when they said, Randy, you should get up and tell these kind of stories. The very first thing I did, and we did a YouTube video about this last summer, about two months before this hunt. I knew this was a high risk, high reward. So I'll say I took a gamble. High risk can equal high reward. If we get a ton of hunting pressure in here, this gamble is not gonna pay off. I was willing to roll the dice and the two people with me were Andrew and Carson from Gerber. And I'd called them, emailed them and said, hey guys, here's the deal. So there's this great big burn drainage. And down below here is a bunch of private where previously this landowner had limited access up into this great big burn drainage. Well, this burn drainage was all public. And once you get out of the drainage, it's all this checkerboard and private. So if we come in here and there's people coming in from the bottom into this burn, we're probably in trouble. But since this landowner has never in the past allowed much in the way of access, we're gonna take this seven mile trek and we're gonna come over the pass with hauling our llamas in our camp and we're gonna set up our camp right up here in the top of this drainage and we're gonna hunt down in here every day, hunt the sides of it, everything. Now, I knew and I warned the guys that if for some reason there's an outfitter or there's pressure coming from the bottom and they move these elk north or south, they're gonna be in places we really can't go and hunt. And unfortunately, just before season opens, this landowner strikes a deal with the Forest Service to say, hey, I'm gonna let people start crossing my property in 2020 in exchange for some easement. I, I'm not sure what their deal was. Well, the landowner's a good guy. He's like, well, heck, I'll let people start coming in here in 2019. And now we have hunting pressure coming in from the bottom where they could camp right here. They could drive to this trailhead that the landowner built and it was only a mile walk and they were up into the core of the burn and there's a creek coming through here. I mean, it's classic. It's everything you look for in e-scouting. Burn, food, water. Previously, lack of good access. So I knew there was a, a high factor of risk and reward to this one, higher than normal. It was a gamble we all decided we were willing to take. So one of the things that comes with this decision to hunt this really tight drainage here, we don't have a lot of options. If these elk get blown out of this drainage, we, we aren't gonna have my normal plan for day one afternoon, morning day two, afternoon day two. Normally on a five day hunt, I've got 10 fallback options. Well, this tight drainage didn't give me a lot of options. So as a consequence, we had what I call lack of options. So if option A to, to go and hunt this drainage in hopes we have it by ourselves, doesn't say that doesn't pan out, what's option B, C, D, you know, on down? Well, with this hunt, I really could only come up with four options. Option A is gonna be the first day and a half we're working option A. And if that doesn't work, well, then we'll go to B, C, and D. Instead of my normal big string of options, this decision here left me with a lot fewer options. But by only having four options, I gave a lot of thought to each of them. And I knew that I would have, in a, in a five-day hunt, 
I would have time to work each of them a little more than I normally would. Maybe one of the biggest mistakes, and it's not a mistake, it's just a reality of our situation, is I only gave myself five hunting days. And I told the guys at Gerber, look, where our calendars line up, there's only five days to hunt. It's gonna take us a full day to get in. We're gonna hunt days one, two, three, four, five, and it's gonna take a full day to get out. When you think about five days of hunting, yeah, normally I would have 10 options available to me, but also with five days of hunting, it doesn't give you much in the way of mulligans if hunting pressure, uh, hot weather, uh, whatever it might be, a blown stock, and you, you get into a drainage where the elk have concentrated, you go in there and you blow a stock and they leave, well, guess what? They may not be coming back in that five days. So. If I do an archery elk hunt with three tag holders, and I was mostly focused on Andrew and Carson, even with two tag holders, I want somewhere from six to 10 days is my preference. Over the course of six to 10 days, you've got a way better opportunity to adapt and make the most of what you find when you get there. And also, if you have eight to 10 options, on day five, six, seven, whatever, you might be circling back to some of your earlier options because the hunting pressure has changed, the whatever it might be. Number four, I, if you wanna say this is a negative, number four is a positive. We had a plan and the plan only had four options, but we stuck to it. So the first, couple days we've went through plan A didn't work we went through plan B it didn't work so now we're left with plan C and plan D so plan C is to hunt way up higher above the burn up in this area and plan D is to take this little there's a creek that comes down here and up in the head of this burn there's still some unburdened timber so that was plan D and that's what gets me to the fact that this is a positive. We had a plan and we stuck to it. If I would have given up on this plan and said, well, heck with it, let's just randomly walk around here and see if we see something, I don't know that we would have. But by sticking to plan C and plan D, all of a sudden we have some encounters. So this is a bit, but I would say this is tactical. Kind of like when you're out in the field is tactical. To me, when you're planning, that's strategic. I probably have that wrong, but that's kind of how I look at this. Now, we're going to get to 5A and B. And they really are setups. What you do in your setup when you have an encounter. And my buddy Corey Jacobson has a course called the University of Elk Hunting. And he goes into so much detail about setups and encounters. Go to elk101.com and when you sign up, uh, I think he's got a promo code Randy. Or, anyway, I know he's got a promo code Elk Talk. Use that. Uh, he'll give you a discount. But so setups and encounters are always tactical. There, what am I doing while I'm out there? What am I reading, hearing, seeing? What's the wind doing? How is the elk behaving? Is it morning where they're on their feet? Are they bedded? What's, what am I doing with the information I'm encountering? So the, the first setup is, setup 5A, is on plan C. Plan C comes together. We go up in this drainage way up here and we get on a little ridge like that comes like over here we climb up there and the elk are in this little pocket right here at the time we it's morning and the thermals are going downhill so we're like well we don't want to come in from above if our winds going downhill so we climbed way up here and we waited until the thermals changed it took us two or three hours of waiting, and now all of a sudden the thermals are coming uphill. All right, 
So what we do is we climb all the way up to this ridge and we find an avalanche chute and we come down in here. And while we're doing that, occasionally we hear a bugle that's like, well, we think he's still up on his feet. We'd actually glass this bull and his cows. So we knew they were in here. Now, when you're talking about setup with rifle versus archery, we're talking about a world of difference. If this would have been a rifle setup, we could have got to this closest ridge and it would have been about a 350 yard shot and that bull would have been dead. But that's not what we were doing. This was archery. By the time the thermals had changed, the cows had went to their bed. And this bull had no satellites around him, no competitors. So when he goes to bed with them, he's not bugling. So all, all we had to go on was where was the last bugle we heard? And I'm gonna blow this up a little bit bigger. There's, we're gonna do all kinds of trees, okay? Bunch of burned out trees. And then there's this big patch of timber right here. And these are all burned out. Some green trees, really thick. So the bull and his cows are bedded in here, but we don't know where. So we come down this chute like this, and we get there, and at least the wind is good. And we're quiet, we're listening. We're like, whereabouts is he? Because this is from here to here is probably 300 yards. Well, when you're gonna set up on a bull, you wanna be as close as you possibly can. We don't hear the bull bugle, and we don't want to give away our location. We're waiting for him to bugle. He doesn't bugle. He doesn't bugle. He makes no noise, no cow calls, nothing. I'm like, well, now what are we going to do? Well, we start getting impatient after about an hour. And so I tell Andrew and Dale, the camera guy, I told them, go and set up right on the edge of this first chunk of timber here. And hopefully that bull, if Carson and I are over here doing our calling, we'll, uh, we'll call him in. Or he'll at least come to the edge of the timber. Well, we shouldn't have got that impatient. Because what happens is the bull is over here with his cows. That's where they're bedded, okay? So this is about 200 yards from where our guys are set up. Well, Carson and I are over here calling, bugling, cow calling. Every once in a while, we'd get a faint response right over here. Well, there's a bench right here and then it drops. And this bull is right on the edge where that bench starts dropping and there's another drainage that comes in this way. He's got his cows bedded right there and he's not moving. Well, it's so thick with the burn and the blowdown, and now the reproduction's starting to grow that you really can't see them. You can't hardly move in on them. It's super, super noisy. So Carson and I start moving around back and forth thinking, well, maybe we can move enough and he stays here, I move there, or vice versa. We'll get that bull to respond. The bull had no reason to respond. He had no satellites anywhere. He's just like, no, I'm just gonna lay here, I'll bugle once in a while. But his bugles were so faint and he was down in this hole, we still couldn't pinpoint him. But now he knows where we're at. He knows we are here. So the plan is crafted that Carson and I will stay out here calling and Dale and Andrew will try to sneak through all this stuff, going through all these trees and see if this bull will make enough noise where they can get there. Well, they start moving and they get in there quite a ways of where they thought they heard the noise. And sure enough, a cow is walking out in front of them. I'm sure these elk heard something coming, no matter how quiet you try to be in blow down burnt timber on steep slopes, you're gonna make a little bit of noise. And the bull gets up out of his bed and we really can't even, the footage of where the bull is, you can't even see the bullet so thick. Finally, he gets up, gets fed up, and he starts feeding out there. So we have footage of the bull walking away, looking back at us. So after all this, we go through everything. We do it right. We work our plan. We get plan C going our way. We find a bull. 
we wait out the thermals, we make this thousand foot climb to come back down, and when we get right there to the real point of truth, we got impatient and we screwed it up. So, that being said, there's a lot to learn from that. There's a lot of benefits of getting that close, of having that encounter of, okay, Let's continue to work our plan. What is the plan D? What, what's the next plan for the last day? Plan D. Now, a lot of good things came from plan D. Plan C goes south. We come back to our camp. And that evening, Carson and Andrew say, you know, we want to just go listen down here. So they, they trot down here to, if the burn is kind of like right at this elevation mostly. This is the burn line. They come down here and they see two spikes over here, little guys. But they hear a bugle back further. So they come back to camp while Dale and I have been doing a bunch of video stuff. And they're like, well, we saw two spikes, but we heard a, di a, a better bugle back in that spot you were talking about. I'm like, well, sounds like spot D is where we're going then in the morning. So we get up in the dark hike down here, and we get on this ridge line right about here, right at the burn level. And we look, well, we hear this bugling, and we look, and up here in spot D is a really nice bull with a group of cows. And they're working up this, if this is a ridge line, they're working up here, and it's really steep. I mean, it's really steep. There's a little patch of unburned timber there, for them to go any higher, they're gonna have to go up this rock chute. So I know the thermals are gonna be changing in the next hour, and for us to drop down here and shimmy up there, we're gonna have some messed up wind about the time we get there. So I wanna get to their elevation. And the reason I wanna get to their elevation is whether you have an uphill thermal or a downhill thermal, if we're at this elevation, at least you're going to have a thermal that is perpendicular to the path you think the elk is gonna come in. So over here, I see this tree. There's one unburned tree over here on a opposing hillside. I'm like, okay, they're right at that elevation. So we drop down here and we start working our way up here and I'm in a hurry. I'm telling the guys, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Because if we end up with a thermal that starts rising and it shoots up one of these little side channels where they're at, the game's up. So we're going and going, we still have a downhill thermal, but it's taken us a while to get there. So as often the case, the cows have been feeding all night, they're looking for a place to bed. And over here is this patch of unburned timber. And I'm thinking, all right, here we, we get up about to here and I see this unburned tree. I'm like, okay, we're at the right elevation. I'm going to wait until he bugles. He doesn't bugle. He doesn't bugle. We don't hear him. Just like the day before, we don't hear anything. Part of that is the time of day. Now it's about 9 o'clock. By the time we get up here, they're starting to look for their beds. So I tell the guys what we're going to do. If I think we're at the same elevation and we've got this squirrely uphill or downhill wind where the thermals are it's warming, but yet it's not a full uphill thermal, so sometimes it's coming downhill. I wanna be at the elevation, I think he is. Andrew, I'm gonna put you slightly downhill. Carson, I'm gonna put you slightly uphill. And when that bull comes, one of you are gonna get a shot. If he's at this elevation, I think he is. So we get set up like that, and the wind is doing its squirrely thing, and we still haven't heard him bugle. And I'm back there cow calling, bugling, he's not responding. Well, I'm slightly over the ridge. I'm, I'm thinking I wanna call him. I, I want him to know I'm over this ridge. So he comes to check me out. Well, he won't communicate. And uh, so I walk over to Andrew and I tell him, I said, look, I'm gonna give him the hold my beer call session. I think that there are bulls out there that say, Oh, really? Ladies, watch this. Hold my beer. And they go and they just scream at another bull. So I walk over to the lip of this little cut there and I just give it everything I have. And before I'm done, he cuts me off. And everybody's like, whoa, he's right there. 
The downside is, yeah, he's close, but that rock shoot, I did not think that they would go up. They are now about 100 feet higher in elevation up on a little bench above that rock chute than I anticipated. So in the time it took us to go this distance, they've moved up the hill about 100 feet in elevation and I've got Carson set up. Now all three of us are below the elk. The point he started from is now about 100 feet in elevation higher. He comes up here and he's at 45 yards above Carson and he comes right through the opening. He. I mean, it was everything you'd want to other than a shot angle when you're down lower, 45 yards uphill doesn't give you much of a shot angle. The bull really didn't stop to give them a shot angle. The cows came milling through. He's like, you know what, I'm going to push these girls out of here. Everything was perfect other than I had never you know, my wildest dream estimated that they would go up that rock chute. I mean, it wasn't a complete rock chute, but it was really steep. If he would have came in from where I thought he was, based on our last sighting and what looked normal, he would have walked right into our lap. Anyhow, that's uh, how it worked for us. It's, it's never perfect. I go back and I look at my notes when I'm drafting these lessons learned episodes. I'm looking at my notes from the hunt and it's like, oh yeah, we did this wrong or we did this right. And I think on this one we did quite a, quite a few things right. Just sometimes you can't over, overcome bad luck and sometimes good luck lets you do a few things wrong and you still end up feeling attacked. So appreciate you watching. I don't know if these are of any value. Um, the next one we're going to do is going to be a successful elk hunt and we're going to show you why we think we had success on that elk hunt. Whereas, you know, the first two were failures. You can learn from both. You can learn what not to do when you have failures and then on some of your, your successful hunts, you're still going to have a few things that didn't work that you remember, but then the things that did work are going to reinforce you to think about that again the next time, or why did that work? How is that applicable to the next hunt? People always say that failure breeds success. Yeah, it does eventually, but sometimes success breeds success also. So, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy them comments down below. Let us know if we're wasting your time or if you want to see more of them. Thank you.